This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to the Chemical Science Building. Uh, this is a building that we built recently in, let's see if I can drive this thing. Uh, that's the back half, actually. Um, well, let's see. Uh, well, okay, the Chemical Science Building is, it was built uh, and handed over to us in 2005. And it was kind of handed over to us in such a hurry that there really wasn't even a startup done on it. Campus people had to do our own startup on a lot of the equipment. And so we got into a building, we turned it on, started teaching class, and we found out this building's not working too well. Uh, so uh, we did have a, a, a monitoring-based project with uh, Cogent on our U-Haul building earlier, and they straightened us out, found a lot of problems for us. And so we recru recruited uh, Charlotte and her team to uh, help us out, and so we went into a, we selected for the MBX process, and we found out a lot of interesting things. The building was constructed in 2005, turned over to us. It's a 5,700 square foot building. It got a lot of lab space in there. Uh, it's, it's connected to our central plant water loop. We also connected to, uh, we have a high temperature hot water loop with individual heat exchangers in each one of the buildings. Same, same goes for this building here. We have uh, redundant pumping for chill water, hot water. We have two air handlers for the lab uh, uh, with four exa exhaust fans. The building's basically split in half. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, we have Two air handlers with 58 BAV terminals for the uh, classrooms and office buildings that are connected. And we have 10 fan coils for, for uh, IT rooms, uh, elevator switch rooms, all that, and they're all connected to the chill water system. Uh, this is our chill water loop. One of the things that we do here is we we'd use the most open valve. It's a campus-wide type strategy that we've adopted on our campus. It's been very successful. As you can see here, we have a nice hot return water 64 degrees, which is a norm for most of the campus's buildings. We run a 24 degree delta. Uh, so we'll try to get this building to blend into our system and you'll see, it will, you'll see in a, a little bit some of the things that didn't get that for us that, we've, that Charlotte and her crew found for us. Uh, also, the chill water pump, pump speed is, is uh, regulated off of the uh, uh, valve positions and you see right here, oh, excuse me, right here we're running at a really slow speed. That's pretty much uh, how everything works. Uh, also here's the most open valve program. It's something that was written on campus. Campus staff actually wrote this program, installed it. Uh, how, we turn it how we turn on the pumps. The pumps normally don't even run. They, they start up when the most open valve gets to about 98%, or in this case we got 100% here, and it stays there for a while. It's been a very good out of the, outside the box strategy thinking. It saved us a lot of uh, power on the infrastructure campus-wide project. Uh, this is the actual speed control program that we wrote and put in. Uh, here, this is just some more slides here showing uh, the, the graphic packages that we work with. We have a, a tritium-based uh, system with, with a lot of data. It collects a lot of points. It's all, uh, it's on the Niagara platform. Uh, and uh, we have two air handlers that serve the, the building. Uh, like I said, it's split in half. There's a, a damper in the middle here where we can actually, if, if one is down for service or whatever, that'll open up and one air handler will feed the entire building. Uh, this is uh, air handler two, or three, excuse me, which uh, serves the uh, BAVs and stuff like that. And then 
We have two exhaust plenums for the uh, uh, laboratory fume hoods. Basically, follows the same ducting with the air handler supply. The exhaust does the same thing. They were supposed to be redundant fans, but we found after they brought the, the building online, we could not maintain enough stack, uh, static in the duct to keep the fume hoods out of alarm, so they run all the time. We have a waste gauge set up over here so that we can see, maintain our stack velocities at the top of the machine, right there. And all this data we're collecting, it's trending in this system. Uh, typical fan coil unit, which we're looking at here, it's all in our graphic package as well, which is really came in handy for the MBX project because we had all this data that uh, Charlotte and her crew could get together. Here again, a VAV typical. And there's a floor plan, and you can drill into any one of these rooms uh, and see all kinds of neat things. Okay, well, we started up this, we collected up all the block programs that Charlotte needed and her team. Uh, blueprints, we checked out the point lists and analog, gave all that to them so that they could analyze what we had. Here's some of the points. Uh, and we also had a lot of complaints from the occupants from day one. We either noisy vents, too cold, couldn't maintain uh, air balancing. It just The building really was just running wild. Uh, so what do we do? We developed a baseline. Uh, here again, using the installed EMS system, which was really good for this, uh, we collected, uh, cal calculated all the tonnage, developed a relationship between the tonnage and outside air. Uh, here again, we set up the different categories, and we had to extrapolate some data because this building was a brand new building, so we had to figure out what this thing would really look at over a long-term history that we didn't have. Uh, and this is kind of some of the data and how we did that. We did the same thing pretty much for the hot water system. We, uh, we here again, and electric, electrical consumption, we, basically the same process over again. Uh, and here's what we came up with, our baseline here, which was a baseline that we measured, and then after we applied, looking at the historical data for weather and a few other things, overlaid it, put ground it all out, and this is what we came up with an adjusted baseline in this column here. Uh, uh, this is just a, the MBX process overview. I think everybody here has probably been through one of these or you've heard about them enough to where I, I don't need to go down through all those little boxes. Uh, and here we, we did our point to point. Uh, this is a group effort between Cogent staff and, and our staff. Just basically checking out the system, making sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. We just, we, and we, and right here we corrected anything like the flow meter I was talking about, some temperatures, temperature gauges or, or sensors that were out of calibration, those kind of things. And here's kind of what we found after we started looking into the building at the investigation. Say we found a chill water valves and we were leaking by the basically valve stroke adjustments, things like that. So we had to get our, our valves in, in control, uh, supply air temperature and resets. Basically, the building was running with static uh, reset. There was none. So, and that really was a problem for us, and, and it, it gave us a lot of uh, occupant comfort issues. Kind of minor dampers and sequencing. So these are some of the things that we were looking at. Uh, chill water, hot water pumps. So what did we do? We, we started, we, we trended things. We got a sequence of operation developed. We got it installed. Uh, we tamed our, our trend data. We created our, our, our graphs, reviews. This is kind of like just a, a, typical, a typical nice night evening in San Bernardino where at, we get about, if we're lucky, we'll get down to 88 degrees at night at two in the morning. And here you can see, we got a hot water valve that's cycling up and down, but thank God the hot water heat exchanger has a lockout on it, so it's not locking, so even though the valve's actuating, but we do see the chill water valve, it's all over the map here. And we're trying to figure out why was this doing this when our set point was right here? 
And here you can see your chill water, uh, your air handler supply temperature bouncing all over the place. Here again, there's a chill water pump that's, a, we're supposed to get our 24 degree delta T and you can see sometimes we're, we're lucky to see five degrees here. Pumps running at 100% the whole time. Well, what we found was this little fan coil in a closet had the valve stuck at 100%, which was telling the chill water pump, I need water. So the chill water pump took off to try to supply it. And we actually froze these guys out because we were well below the, the temperature set point. And these are the type of issues that we found. So once we got that all done, we had zone, zone presence sensors on our, on our uh, hoods. Some were not connected, some didn't work. So, so we got those all fixed. We got our resets in, we got our, uh, implemented a low airflow VAV set point. Now this is kind of an interesting thing that we did. Uh, for heating and real cold air with the VAV system, they go to minimum flow. You can't get the heat to go down to where the people are. So when a hot water pump comes on, the VAVs will go to max position so that we can get good airflow in there to heat on real cold days. This did work for us. Uh, what did we learn? If you're going to build a new science building, commission it. Because the builder, when he built it and it looked like it and it had a paint job on it, he left. And when we tried to teach in it, uh, it didn't work. Make sure your, your metering in place is accurate. Learn how to get out of the, out of the box to acquire your, your trends. Now this was kind of neat. All those data screens that you saw gave us a lot of information, but we couldn't get it out of the server because our server would only allow you to grab little bits of chunks of information at a time. Charlotte's team, when we, we called uh, Invensys, in we said, how can we get into this thing? They showed us how to do an in run around the program and basically grab the entire database and extract it out so that we can do these big trends. And Charlotte said, I remember that day, because you were like, oh yeah, all right. Very happy, and that was really helped the process along to where you could find a lot of being able to get all that data out and install it. Problem was though, when we had all this data rolling into our system, you gotta know your limit to your file capacity. We had 20 gig of data which crashed our system. That's when we learned, hey, you know what? Collecting data is great, but you gotta learn to know your, like Clint Eastwood said, you got to know your limitations. So, and of course, back it up. You know, I forgot to tell you what we saved on this thing. So real quick, the project cost $152,000. Annual savings is about 50,000 bucks. Three year payback on that. Uh, we saved uh, 184 tons of carbon per year is what this thing translates to. We did not do a, any fan management like I wanted to do. I was really impressed with Mike's presentation yesterday and I'm definitely gonna uh, pursue the Acuity system, which I think will overlay on our system really well. We can pick up some KWH. Because we only picked up 112,000 kWh for the year. Well, our big savings came from basically all that heating and cooling that you saw going on that was going right up, right up these pretty s stacks up there. So, and that's us. Um, it's an opportunity to be here with you to present our commissioning project, which won the best practice award for the UC system. And uh, middle of last year, through the partnership program, we were approached by the uh, program administrators that there are still available funds and incentives to do additional projects. So we went ahead and reviewed our list of potential projects on campus and came up with two additional MBCX uh, projects, and Tang Center is one of them. So I'll give you a, a background of how we implemented the commission project in the building. The uh, discussion I will present to you start, will start with the project summary, and I'll describe to you what, uh, why we chose the Tang Health Center uh, building on campus, and I'll in line or, um, enumerate the measures that we implemented for the project. I'll show you some, some of the verified achieved savings in the building, and share with you lessons learned and what we need to do next for the project. So what we did for the uh, uh, campus of about over 100 buildings, we 
benchmarked and uh, indicated or measured, calculated the number of uh, energy uh, users in each building and calculated for the energy use index. Tang Center is one of our top 20 buildings on campus with high energy usage, so that's why we chose the building. Through the uh, commissioning project, we were able to meter the building, providing real-time metering for gas and electric. So we were able to develop baseline models for the energy consumption in the building. One of the things we did for the project is work closely with a controls contractor, and then explain why we have an, had an existing control system in the building which has failed. For two years, it has been um, running on manual or local mode. So the building was running 24-7. So we decided to go ahead and upgrade the control system using the automated logic system. So this control system, we're able to identify potential projects and measures and implement them through energy control strategies. This is the uh, overall sort of our project. So combined gas and electric savings. Our target for the project when we applied for the commissioning project is only 15%. And at the end of the project, we doubled that result, combined electric and gas, which is about 105 kBTUs per square foot per year. Although we had a six-month duration for the project, we were still able to look into possible HVAC retrofits, which I'll be discussing, and potentially we can do more work in the building for the 09 partnership program. So what's the building? The building is a student health center, and it's also our backup for campus emergency. It also serves a nearby uh, college, Mills College, so all their students also come to campus for their health needs. It's a 75,000 square foot building built in 1993, so it's about 15 year old building, three story. And if you notice the energy use intensity, it's about 150 kBTUs per foot per year. On average for our campus, it's only about 80. So that's about double. So we focus on this building. There's lots of potential to do uh, commissioning and retrofits in the building. And there are four direct expansion units, uh, four package units on the roof that serves just the in interior spaces in the building. The perimeter areas are, um, have operable windows, and for heating, they have radiators. The package units have inlay uh, uh, vanes, guide vanes that uh, modulate for economizer. For the heating requirements, the, the building has a boiler, a gas fire boiler. And it's uh, open Monday to Friday, 8 to 6, regular uh, operating hours, and Saturdays from 9 to 5. I mentioned earlier that the automation system has failed, so we've got the building running 24-7 mechanically. So the building has a non-functioning control system, so the economized operation is was not functioning, and uh, there is no scheduling function, therefore 24-7 operation. For the units that have been installed 15 years ago, we, we didn't have enough uh, maintenance programs, so it has to be serviced and maintained with all those four package units. So when we implemented the new control system, the ALC, Automated Knowledge Controls, we were able to implement these measures, including scheduling. So we were able to turn off the air handling units, the chiller and the boilers at night when they're not actually occupied, the building's not occupied, and on Sundays when the building is actually closed. Another measure that we did was uh, before the uh, supplier temperature was at a fixed set point. So we were able to adjust that supplier temperature. Based on sample temperatures that we have on the zones, we put in the four temperature sensors on each floor as a representation for the building, and also took into account the outside air temperature to reset the supply air temperature. And finally, the boiler blackout. Um, we had a, instituted a control, control strategy based on outside air temperature, so the boiler won't come on until the temperature is under 50 degrees. The static pressure for the four package units is at uh, one and a half uh, PSI. We reduced that to a, an inch and a quarter, therefore adding additional savings to the building. Here's the uh, tank center um, electricity use what we've done is uh, calculate the average daily 
KWH for the building. So prior to the commissioning project, we developed a baseline period. And from that, as you can see, the building operates pretty much between the range of 4,000 to 6,000 uh, KWH per day. When the commissioning project was implemented and all measures put in place, this is your cutoff here, you, show us, uh, you see a shift in the energy use electrically, whereby the, the peak or the highest usage was about 400, the minimum before, or 4,000, and now it's gone down to about a little over 2,000 per day, KWH. We've adjusted for this to account for the outside air temperature fluctuations when we did the uh, MMV or measurements and verification. This is for the natural gas analysis. Again, we did an MMV. Uh, we had, prior to the metering, uh, real-time metering of the building, we did a two-year monthly consumption reading of the building. And on average, it's about 700 uh, therms hour per day, I mean per hour, right here. And so after the commissioning project was done, we were able to modulate or uh, regulate the use of gas in the building, ranging from about below six, and it goes down to about half um, therms per hour. Okay, what are the lessons learned? Um, we focus mainly on mechanical areas, but also spend time looking at zones, which uh, where we have uh, VAV boxes, and uh, what we found out that the temperature sensors in some of the areas were kind of situated at the areas where it's between the condition space and a space that are not. So you have that mixing of temperatures, so we re relocated those sensors in order to get a better reading for those temperature locations. Some of the things that happen when, with the incorrect location is you've got this excessive cooling going on for those areas. Um, the building engineer is a very good resource person on talking or finding out what the historical problems are in the building, so we were able to address those. And then, uh, again, we have to go back and do some VAV tuning. And for those who are interested, for gas metering, um, you can do a real-time pulse output uh, to your EMS. You can contact your local utility. With this pro program here, we're able to do that with pg &E. It's about $1,500 for them to do the pulse output connected to our EMS. Okay, next steps, uh, we're gonna be closely working with our commissioning agent quest to find out more potential projects. Although the commissioning project is done, we'll be able to do more additional uh, measures and implement that this year. And finally, we are working closely with the control system, uh, air systems, we installed our automated geologic controls to develop more screens and monitoring and maybe a tool to keep the persistence level of the commissioning project going on. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, Harry West Jim, uh, similar to Cal State uh, San Bernardino's project, this was completed four or five years ago, and it turns out that the design intent uh, for lighting was inadequate. And so here we are having a building where we now need to think about a lighting retrofit four years after we accepted it. So uh, in consistency with the AIA learning objectives, you're gonna learn a little bit about how to correct lighting illumination deficiencies through daylighting or daylight harvesting and energy efficient lighting today. But this uh, project is at San Diego City College, which is in downtown San Diego. Um, beautiful location, we're proud of it, and it's been around uh, almost 100 years. The Harry West Gym uh, is uh, shown here on this particular photo, but uh, we have room for up to 2,000 spectators. We host a number of basketball and volleyball and, and badminton tournaments. And I guess uh, City College is the three-time reigning badminton champion in the state of California, if you're interested. So. But anyhow, this is the existing condition that we inherited, and you can see that these are uh, light readings and foot candles. Uh, we have three quarts within the gym, but the one on the left here you'll see that we're looking at single digit foot candles here. And in general terms, they're uh, as low as 4.4 foot candles there, mid-court, uh, left center. And you know, they get a little bit better as we move towards the, the, the north court. But you know, at the best that we're doing is about 49 foot candles. 
significantly less than what's typically required for uh, collegiate athletics. So what do we do about this? We, we looked at various options. I mean, obviously, you could replace the HID lighting with something else and just double, uh, double what you have, and you could you know, double your energy consumption and, and uh, deal with the problem that way. But what we looked at is there's a, um, a daylight harvesting technology. Daylight uh, Inside is the name of the, of the uh, company that assisted us here. But replacing the HIDs with uh, T5 fixtures and these daylight uh, harvesting uh, skylights. Well, this shows you in general terms where the skylights were going to be placed and uh, various uh, readings that you see there in, in red. But we're replacing 4,750 watt HID uh, fixtures with uh, the T5s and then the 20 daylight harvesting fixtures, which are the skylights. And bottom line is over 116,000 kilowatt hours saved on an annual basis. Now, that translates into our current uh, consumption rates with San Diego Gas and Electric, about $17,000, $18,000 a year. It's, it's not uh, insignificant. Uh, it, the, the big driver behind this is really getting our lighting levels to the point where we could host uh, collegiate tournaments. That was a very big deal for uh, our dean of, um, uh, of athletics. Some of the other advantages, ultimately this $12,000 in incentives, we've just recently recalculated that, and that's almost double what we uh, anticipated when we put this uh, presentation together. So we began this back in November 2008, and this kind of shows you what the uh, existing conditions were with the, uh, the HIDs here in the, in the lower uh, portion. And And this is what the installation looked like on the metal seam roof up above. You can see in the lower right-hand corner that we actually water tested everything. Uh, any of you in facilities know that whenever you make penetrations in the roofs, uh, we tend to have problems. And so uh, we at least wanted to make certain that we didn't have any problems from the get-go um, with this particular uh, application. And you can see we're right literally downtown San Diego. So. So energy savings, this particular table shows you uh, what we would have consumed with the 750 watt HIDs if uh, we'd uh, used that as our uh, alternative to solve our illumination problem versus what the T5s would consume. And you can see that there's you know, roughly a $17,000 difference on an annual basis, and that's assuming $15 uh, per kWh. We're not looking at uh, the impacts on demand charges and other things, just very simply. So. We saw this earlier. This was the uh, pre-existing condition. And we went back uh, after we put in the uh, daylight harvesting fixtures. And what were single digits, you can now see you're all well in the, into the, the double digits. Uh, center court were uh, about 100, uh, as high as 114-foot candles uh, just with uh, natural daylight. Pretty significant. And uh, that's a big deal even on a great cloudy day like we have here in Santa Barbara, which we have frequently in San Diego this time of year. Uh, we're still getting adequate illumination levels. So what happens at nighttime? Well, uh, basically that's when we fire up our T5s, and you can see the illumination levels there are um, on the order of 50-foot candles or, or higher, which is uh, uh, quite good. Uh, this was just a quick comparison slide, but you can see here in the pre-existing um, uh, whoever prepared this doesn't understand the uh, significant digits, but you know, aside from that, uh, we looked at 18-foot candles on the uh, pre-existing condition to 76 for the daylight harvesting mode, uh, and then 54 when we're using the T5 fixtures. So pretty significant uh, change. I mean, basically, we're, we're tripling the lighting with the T5s over the, uh, over the existing condition and uh, even doing even better with the daylighting. So uh, quickly, what did it cost us? $105,000. We did get some HID rebates from San Diego Gas and Electric, as well as the KWH saved. Um, so about 11,000. Subsequently, we've recalculated that. It's, it's more like 21,000. That five cents per kilowatt hour is, has gone up rather significantly with their new incentive program. So the net cost to us was 93 grand. And if you look at that, here's uh, basically a uh, analysis on your re return on investment. Uh, this one actually includes depreciation, which doesn't apply to most of us here in this room. But bottom line, simple rate of return, 3.98 years. So essentially, four-year four rate of return 
um, from a simple perspective on this and uh, addressed our needs for illumination. Now, from a sustainability perspective, what does this mean? Well, by using daylight harvesting, we're essentially reducing 261,000 pounds of carbon dioxide emission on an annual basis. Okay, well, that's, that's a big number. What does that mean? Well, that's equivalent to 22 cars off the uh, San Diego freeway. I think this is actually a, a photo from LA, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we do have our traffic problems down in San Diego. So we'll answer questions if you have any towards the tail end. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully you were able to attend the conference at Cal Poly last year that we hosted in 2008. Uh, this is a photo of the, the old campus. Those buildings no longer exist, but it really used to be just a farm in the middle of the open fields with some of our original buildings. Founded in uh, 1901. Um, obviously, we have multiple eras of construction, a variety of technologies. We've gone through uh, many changes over the years. The last major lighting retrofit was in uh, 2001, where we finally get, got rid of pretty much the last of our T12s and magnetic ballasts and PCBs. And uh, the technology has changed enough that we're ready to take a fresh look at uh, our lighting systems and, and do some big retrofits again. In preparation for uh, the conference last year, we worked with uh, the peer program to, to implement these technology demonstration programs, a number of different technologies, used them for the walking tours for the conference. And uh, I'd like to, to uh, recognize and thank uh, Wes Morgan, formerly from the CLTC, now, now working for us, for the good guys at the CSU. <laughs> Uh, as well as Corey Jackson from CLTC, and of course the peer program. Uh, one of the things we did was to make sure to put all those folks in contact with our ESCO that was working on our campus-wide energy audit to educate those, those folks, our consultants, about these latest technologies and look for opportunities to implement them. So the first one, this is, this is pretty easy, low-hanging fruit. If you haven't done this, you really should. Uh, smart bi-level stairwell fixtures. Uh, you'd be amazed how little time of the day your stairwells are occupied, especially in an academic setting where you have a cyclical traffic pattern in the buildings following the class schedules from the, uh, I, I like to refer to it as the hourly migration from on the hour to 10 after, whatever your, whatever your campus schedule is. Uh, estimated up to 95% of the day, there's nobody in the stairs. Of course, we have to keep them lit for safety, for egress purposes, but we don't have to keep them lit at maximum level all the time. So this is a product. Uh, available on the market, integrated motion sensors built into the fixture, integrated dimming ballast. Uh, each one is standalone, so you don't have to rewire your system. It's simply a fixture replacement. Uh, they have emergency fixtures available, so they have uh, battery backup built in. And very simple, they use uh, ultrasonic motion sensing technology. So it works well in, in interior stairwells. Exterior stairwells you need to be a little careful on because they can be sensitive to air movement and wind. Um, they dim down to 20% output when the stairwell is not occupied and immediately ramp up to full output when somebody opens the door and steps into the stairwell. The M and V on this portion of our project indicated an energy savings and net energy savings of approximately 90% against our baseline. Um, in our office building, both in the private offices and in our conference rooms, we had these throughout. A variety of two, three, and four lamp fixtures in uh, 32 watt T8s. And the glare was so bad that we had multiple people with the glare screens on their monitors, on their PCs. Uh, some people could be seen wearing visors at their workstation. Um, many people had taken to uh, performing some amateur electrical work and delamping their own fixtures or cutting out manila folders to kind of block light. It was really horrible. So we looked for uh, an opportunity to redo this completely, do a bit of a lighting redesign as part of the integrated office lighting system. Um, we figured we were using an average of about 110 watts per fixture. We retrofit these using uh, the Lithonia RT5 uh, retrofit kit. Uh, we got turned on to these by our colleagues at uh, the Long Beach campus had used this as their campus standard and gone T5 campus-wide. We weren't really convinced we wanted to move to T5, uh, but at the time, Lithonia wasn't making this fixture in a, in a T8. They do now. Um, that, and that is going to be, that is becoming our campus standards, is this, uh, the Lithonia RT8 fixture. Same, same uh, troffer style, same reflector, same lens, but in a T8 lamp. So uh, with the T5 retrofit, we put those in a number of our offices. We moved our color temperature from 3500K to 4100K, a little brighter, wider light. Um, 
These came with a step dimming ballast. Many of the offices we found were able to run at the low setting permanently at 50% output. So we went from about a 110 watts per fixture down to about 34 watts per fixture. The uh, Lithonia refers to this fixture as a volumetric fixture. The way, they, the way they've designed it for light distribution, uh, the performance is amazing. You go from these things shooting straight down uh, to these, and uh, I wish I had some better photos to show you, but the lighting distribution, the evenness around the room, the lighting of the walls was night and day different. Um, the higher color temperatures, of course, result in a higher perceived light level. It's better for our older eyes, and like I said, the, the, T8, the RT8 is going to be our campus standard. Also as part of the integrated office lighting system, and thank you CLT, I stole some of your photos, because um, our desks aren't nearly this organized. Uh, so as part of the integrated office lighting system, the general philosophy is to reduce your overhead lighting and bring light to the task plane where you need it, where you're working. So we use the fine light uh, PLS, or personal lighting system. It's a, a suite of uh, three different wattages of desk lamps and under cabinet LED lamps. These are all LED. Um, the six waters, there's six, nine, and 12 watts. Uh, the six waters turned out to work for almost everybody. Uh, a few nines, I don't think we needed to use any of the 12s. They were extremely popular. In fact, we had a few spaces uh, where we installed these, and I literally installed these in maybe 10 minutes per office at the most. Uh, if people were gone on vacation, the next day their PLS was gone and it was in somebody else's office. <laughs> They're extremely, extremely popular. So, uh, in fact, a number of the folks in our office don't use their overhead lights at all, myself included, and we just work strictly with the, the LED lights. So I went from roughly 100 watts in my office down to a total of about 12. Also, as part of this, um, you wouldn't see it in the picture, but on the floor or, or on the wall, you'd have a little power supply, a little DC power supply that plugs into the wall, has uh, ports for every fixture to plug into to supply them, as well as uh, a little phone jack to go to a motion sensor, passive infrared motion sensor that mounts underneath your desk. And uh, when you step out of the office in a few minutes, your desk lights will go off automatically, as well as your overhead lights. Great system. These, uh, the total package, the overhead lighting retrofit and the PLS reduced our office lighting energy by about 80%. So we also implemented some uh, integrated classroom lighting demonstration uh, projects, a couple of different locations, and uh, the general approach we were using a fine light product is to, is to go from your plain old uh, flush mount uh, fluorescent wrap fixtures to a pendant mounted fixture with an up light and down light component. Um, for the teaching environment, you have a number of uh, operating modes. So you have a separate circuit for your uh, lights in front of the projector screen uh, or whiteboard fixture. They integrate uh, dual technology motion sensors that in include both ultrasonic and passive infrared to turn the lights off when nobody's in the room. And lots of controllability for the occupants for different teaching modes. So these pictures represent uh, general instruction mode with all the lights on, the down lights and the up lights on, and this would be an AV mode with the up lights turned off, down light only, and the, the whiteboard light turned off so they can see the digital projection screen clearly. So uh, there was also a teacher control panel at the front of the room with uh, switches so that the teacher has full control without having to leave the, the teaching space at the front to change modes. Uh, the two projects we implemented, uh, one of them was used for the conference and a uh, great lesson learned. We had to paint that room first. Paint, paint has an amazing impact on the way your lighting looks. So we took kind of a dingy old room and put a nice coat of fresh white paint on it. The lighting was really improved. We implemented this in, in a large auditorium classroom. Uh, that system, we used uh, the direct indirect uh, pendant mounted fixture with separate whiteboard fixture control. Uh, teaching mode and AV mode. That project, uh, without dimming capability, just having the, the couple of lighting modes and the motion sensing technology resulted in an energy reduction of about 50%. We also implemented the uh, ICLS in a, a more challenging room. This is one of our conference rooms in our facility management building with a very low ceiling. That's about an eight foot ceiling at the most. You wouldn't think you could do pendant mounted fixtures in there, but we did and it worked quite well. This is during construction. You can see 
some of the, uh, the ceiling uh, flush mount wrap fixtures are still there, had not been removed yet. I think we took out a total of uh, 16 32 watt lamps, replaced them with uh, a total of 10. And we also got rid of, in the center of the room where these pendant mounted fixtures are, there was a row of flood spots that were used for different presentation lighting modes. So we got rid of quite a bit of lighting. And typically when we have meetings in this room now, uh, we run the little dimmer controls right over here on the wall. It's rarely above 50%. And when we have meetings in there where we have to use the, the projection screen, uh, even without having separate whiteboard fixtures, we just dim it down a little bit and, and get wonderful lighting in the room. Uh, the lighting energy for this particular room was reduced by 30% with this system. Uh, we also did a, a little bit of uh, street light work, a blend of different technologies. So uh, again, in front of Cerro Vista, there's an example of uh, some LED street lights. We did both LED and HID uh, smart dimmable fixtures. So you have a motion sensor on the pole detecting motion going by. Uh, obviously, this would not be appropriate for street lights for traffic use with cars going by at 30 miles an hour. The motion sensing doesn't really make sense. But for pedestrian walkways, uh, parking lots, it's a very applicable technology. So we replaced some 100 watt HPS uh, shoebox lights with this mix of uh, a little bit of LED and a little bit of HID. The LEDs are an 80 watt fixture that dim down to 35% output when no motion is detected. Those resulted, uh, I didn't put the energy, oh, there we go, 50%, I got them mixed up. 50 and 40% energy savings net between the two, between the two systems. Uh, both result in a, a major improvement to color rendition. So of course the HPS fixtures, high pressure sodium, give you that, you know, somebody has to call the cops to report an incident. And it was a guy wearing a brown sweatshirt in a brown car with brown pants because everything is kind of that reddish brown color at night. Uh, the color rendition is significantly improved here. Uh, I'll show you a nice slide about that in just a minute. So from the M and V, this was kind of interesting to look at in front of the dorms. You know, these uh, are catching a, a major pedestrian walkway here for the students returning to their dorms after, after classes or at the end of the night, going to the library or, uh, you know, looking at the behavior patterns here. You see a lot of activity during the day. Then we get to midnight. The students are still studying hard, kind of wrapping things up. So you can see kind of a little bit of cyclical nature of the hour-long cycles. And then we have things winding down. And then right after 2 a.m., <laughs> have another, another little burst of activity at 2 a.m. I'm sure they're coming home from the library, right? <laughs> and finally, they're all in bed. And, and you get great, great uh, you know, reduction at night with no activity. But of course, it's the area under the curve, right, is your total energy. So there's a lot of short periods when the light is reduced and some nice chunks here where it's down for a number of hours. So both of these technologies have reduced our, our net energy by uh, 40 to 50 percent. <clears throat> okay, lessons learned. So Wes tried his best to teach me as a, as a dumb mechanical engineer about lighting technology and the difference between scotopic and photopic light. And uh, those are great short words that mean a lot of stuff. But this, is, this diagram over here is, is a great representation of it. So these photos are of the same vehicles parked in the same spot in the same parking lot before and after a retrofit to LED. So look at, look at the lighting with high pressure sodium lights, 300 watts per fixture, 21,000 lumens with a color rendition index of 22, very low, very poor. Compare that to an LED system with less than half the wattage, a little over a third of the total lumen output, but a much higher color rendition uh, index of 75, almost performing with indoor fluorescent light. You know, which, which one of those parking lots would you rather have your daughter walk into the car by herself in? It's, it's pretty clear. So what this is having to do is with is the, the difference in the way the human eye perceives light intensity or lumens and color rendition. So in, in fact, color rendition can be more, infor more important than light output. So wherever you have a chance to raise your color temperature, and especially on exterior lights, look at induction technology, look at LED technology. The lighting uh, improvement is enormous. Um, which, what you need to be careful of, though, is that the color temperature is so different, you don't want to mix them, either within a building or between a street and a parking lot. 
that's kind of upsetting to the eye to have a, a drastic change in color temperature. The eye doesn't receive that well. In fact, in our own building, we weren't able to retrofit every single space. So we had some offices with 4,100K, some with 3,500K, and it was, it was bothersome. Uh, people complained about the light being blue, bluish, because of that change of walking from the, the yellowish, orangish 3,500K hallways into an office with 4,100K. So when you change them, change them all. Uh, LEDs can have a very, a very bright source. You know, the LEDs are, are very intense, can be perceived as a little harsh. The street lights that we implemented when you walk by, kind of like these spots, uh, they're, they're so harsh, they're a bit, of a, a bit of a glare. So I think on our campus, we're probably going to be looking more toward the induction technology. It's a little bit cheaper up front cost with almost the same uh, energy savings as LED. Uh, LEDs, you have to be careful. They claim very long lamp life, but uh, it's not the lamp that's going to fail first. It's going to be the driver, the power supply. So be careful to look into the quality of the materials you're looking at. And control of heat, heat rejection is critical to life of LEDs. Again, smart bi-level technologies aren't going to give you a lot of help in high traffic areas because you're not going to have enough downtime. Um, so take that into consideration. And with any project, uh, outreach, outreach and education to the folks that are going to be impacted is critical beforehand. So for instance, uh, talking to our housing folks and our university police was a, a big part for us. And there's uh, credits and references, so thank you very much. The first thing that people think about is the, the energy savings. And what we started with was how much of our energy is going to lighting on the campus. We are a pretty large campus. We use 250 million kilowatt hours per year. And I wanted to get a sense of our lighting, how much of the, the lighting was represented in that energy. Turns out it's about 58 million kilowatt hours a year for, for lighting sources, interior, exterior combined. And just focusing on the exterior, we have our parking lots, roads, pathways. Separate category are all the wall packs that are attached to the exterior buildings. But this piece alone is about uh, six and a half million kilowatt hours a year. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning, We're tackling that piece. Again, energy is the first thing that comes to mind. Everyone's interested in the energy savings, which has the corresponding CO2 emission reductions for sustainability. But what really is, um, what made this go wasn't the energy savings in initially. What um, sort of piqued my curiosity was driving to our campus. And has anyone been to UC Davis? So a number of you have. And if you've, if you've driven by on Highway 80, we have a beautiful Mandavi Performing Arts Center. And it's a, it's a very new and attractive area. Right to the south of it, butting up to the freeway, is a huge surface parking lot. And if you're driving home in the winter or early in the morning hours, you go past, and there are hundreds and hundreds of lights on, and no cars, no people in sight. So doing that day after day, it just sort of bothered me. And uh, I thought, that, you know, this doesn't look good. Here's the one of the premier higher education institutes in the, uh, in, the, in the world. And people were coming by and must be scratching their heads. Why are the lights on? There's no one here. So I was lucky enough to stumble into the Lighting Technology Center, where I met Michael Saminovich, who's the director, Wes Morgan, Corey Jackson, and uh, a host of other really bright and talented folks. And we just started talking about what our commonalities were, what were my perceived problems, what were they working on, and it led to this, this notion of the bi-level. What was uh, fun about it, it wasn't necessarily developing any new widget that didn't exist before, it was taking a lot of products and ideas and technologies that existed and combining them and improving upon them to produce a, a more reliable and robust system. And really the, the benefits were as you can see, we were, we were interested in safety. One of the first things I did was to enlist our campus police chief and our transportation and parking services director. We knew we needed to get their buy-in and wanted to have them not just buy-in at the end, but be collaborative, develop ideas along the way so we didn't waste any time and knew that we were on the right track. Energy savings is obvious. The other piece, I, I'm on the, uh, the O&M side of the house, so 
Maintenance is, is a big deal for me. I have three people that are dedicated to exterior lighting for a 5,300-acre campus. We have over 4,000 lights on poles, about the same number attached to the building exteriors. So we have a lot of lights and not too many people to take care of them. So when we look at lamp changes every year and a half to two years, that gets to be troublesome both from a manpower standpoint and also from the, the campus's standpoint in terms of reliability, risk, and uh, maintaining a well-lit environment. The public image piece was the first thing I talked about, driving past and seeing lights on when no one's making a, any beneficial use of that energy. And uh, the lighting quality, which Dennis has spoken to, we were, we were very interested in look, going from that uh, the low CRI, high pressure sodium environment, the orange haze that the students would always comment on when we did surveys, to the, the higher CRI of the, the, the metal halides, the LEDs, the induction fixtures, where you can tell the silver car from the, the gold car and the brown pants and all those things. So they were also attributes that the police were interested in, in terms of being able to identify someone who is a perpetrator of a crime, better identifying them, and the other point that Dennis made about the awareness with bi-level technology of increasing and uh, decreasing the, the lighting levels is a, sort of a natural. Uh, what, I, so what I've done is instead of a lot of bullets and things, I'll just uh, have some photographs of uh, what we've done and what they look like. This is our north entry parking structure. This is, uh, when we're in our demonstration phase, this is one of the first bi-level induction fixtures that was installed. Over here you can see one of the 175 high pressure sodium fixtures. Uh, the ones that were out here, we have perimeter sensing on everything, so those are off. And this is a 150 watt metal halide in its uh, last stages of life. This is one of our electricians installing the, the first generation. They're, they were uh, very easy to install. Uh, this large sensor, this is the first generation, looks like a giant hockey puck. And uh, the, actually, the latest incarnation is about a fifth of that size. And uh, it's been improved. We had a great relationship with the CLTC and basically access to the vendor and working on everything from the size of this, the reliability of this, and some of the internal circuits to being out there when the contractors are doing the installation or our folks and understanding what could be done to make this more plug and play. And there were quite a few things that were identified in that process to basically speed up the installation. Now, this is that north entry structure during construction, uh, the installation. And you can see these are the new induction uh, lights with the, the higher CRI. These are the HPS, and the picture speaks for itself. Uh, this is a nice one of that same structure, lower level. And again, side by side, you can see the HPS environment and the clean, bright induction environment we have over there. Uh, uh, that's another level. Um, people came, came in afterwards and they wanted to know, did we, did we paint the structure? Did we clean it? You know, what did we do? It was so bright. They just couldn't believe that it was the same place. And uh, we went in. These are 100-watt these are fixtures. And actually, the, the manufacturer, same one that uh, Dennis referred to, they've got improved optics. So with our next go-around, we'll be doing uh, about 900 more of these in the next couple of months, and they'll be 70 watt fixtures. This is another installation we did. We wanted to sort of dip our toe in the LED pond, and uh, we were pretty careful about what we selected. We wanted something that was reliable. I was getting phone calls, emails, all kinds of solicitations from everybody and their brother who was making some kind of an LED fixture from China, Taiwan, or Timbuktu. And that's where we relied on the CLTC to really filter and sort out the, uh, the wheat from the chaff. These are very expensive. We did about 50 of them on top of this uh, parking structure in that performing arts area. The aesthetics were a consideration there. We did want to try LED. And um, the, other, the other benefit was the fixture that had been here before was a, almost a flood fixture that was adapted for the use uh, for parking. And from the freeway, it was just a huge, huge glare bomb. 
these are full cutoff, so when you're, when you're in the area, it's, uh, it's, it's very nicely lit. But before, all of this would have been illuminated, and you could have seen this like it was, it was daylight. So we have a, a pretty nice distribution of lighting. Uh, there's a, you know, somewhat uh, hot spots and dark spots, but nothing near what it was before. And uh, again, we're looking at hopefully a 100,000 hour lamp life. So rather than every two years, maybe every 12 years, we'll be changing lamps. And we still have to address ballast and the other components. But uh, it turned out very nicely. And it's a very high profile area for the campus. Uh, we delved into some other things. We currently have a, oh, about 20 of these uh, up on the north entry of our campus. This is a full cutoff Cobra fixture. It's induction. It's not by level. We're not ready to, to go that way on roadways yet. But uh, we do have some that we'll install in parking lots, similar to the one that Dennis showed at Cal Poly. Uh, this is an, uh, one of the earlier demonstrations, just to show that we also tried this with a number of HID fixtures. This, this is a metal halide. And uh, it generally works. We ran into some issues with uh, certain lamps don't like to really work in the horizontal orientation. And uh, we had problems in, in one of the demonstration lots where the lights just wouldn't work. And it was a matter of trial and error working with the lighting technology folks where we came to understand that it was actually a, a different type of bulb that needed to be specced. Uh, that's all I had, other than um, throwing out a couple of factoids about uh, the differences in the energy consumption. We've, we're, we're basically looking at 100 watt fixtures that are, the combined fixture is about 110 watts with lamp and ballast, and that's replacing a 138 watt system. And that's just the, the reduction you get from replacing the technology. Then with the bi-level component, we found that for the parking structures, using data loggers and metering, that those lights are typically on in the high mode about 40% uh, uh, of the time now, and 60% of the time off hours, they're down at 50% lighting. And for the, the surface lots, it's about a 55-45 split between high mode and low mode. So in addition to that approximate 15-20% uh, savings just on the, the output, add the bi-level component, and you're in anywhere from 40 to 70 percent combined for the system. So it, uh, it's, it's truly a, a good savings. It provides a lot of benefits. I think, I think there are more benefits than just the, uh, the energy savings. And the current build out that we're involved with is going to be about a million dollars. It's going to save a projected 1.25 million kilowatt hours a year. So if you took that at 10 cents, you can, you can do that math pretty easily and see what the savings are anywhere from seven to 11 years, uh, simple payback just on the energy. If you throw in maintenance savings and some of the other intangibles, you're probably down in the six to seven year range for that much trouble. So back to Artie.